And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Black and Blue Pod. I am your host, Matt McLaughlin, here with Timmy Gorman. We're going to do some uh, college football conversation. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, are they for real? I This is the most giddy I've ever been excited about the Philadelphia Eagles since Carson Wentz 2017. Um, we're going to, and we're also going to be talking about teams with rough starts in a new segment called Deep Fake or Real Deal. Uh, and also, Maybe we'll do some other stuff at the end. Don't re- don't really know right now, but college football top twenty five for uh, what is this week four now? We're going on week four. Yeah. Uh, top top twenty five is in. Uh, I'm going to quickly run through the rankings, and we're really only going to talk about Notre Dame and Penn State because those are the only teams that we sincerely care about. So, number one through five. Number one, Georgia. Number two, Alabama. Number three, Ohio State. Number four, Michigan. And number five, Clemson. Nothing changes there in the top five from the previous week. Six through 10. Six, Oklahoma. Seven, USC. Those two teams do not move at all in their positionings compared to last week either. Number eight, Kentucky moves up a spot. Number nine, Oklahoma State moves down. Ten, Arkansas stays in the t- in the top ten in the nation. Number 11, the Tennessee Volunteers move up four spots. Number 12, NC State, the Wolf Pack, jumping into the top 12, moving up four slots as well. Number 13, Utah, climbing, slowly climbing back in to possibly the top 10 conversation. Number 14, my Penn State Nittany Lions at number 14, moving up eight spots after a dominant win over Auburn, which we'll get to. Number 15, Oregon moves up 10 spots. Had a really rough opening game against Georgia, which wasn't really a neutral site game, even though that's what it's officially listed as. And so that being said, Oregon with a bounce back win against BYU, they move up 10 slots in the new AP poll. Number 16, Ole Miss moves up four spots. 17, Baylor stays at 17. Number 18, Washington goes from not ranked to 18. Number 19, BYU drops down seven spots. 20, Florida, the Gators drop down two. 21, the Wake Forest Demon Deacons drop two spots. Number 22, the Texas Longhorns drop another spot down. Number 23, the Texas A&M Aggies off of a a historic upset to Appalachia State the previous week, bounce back with a win over the Miami Hurricanes. They move up a spot. 24, Pittsburgh Panthers move down one. And number 25, the University of Miami Hurricanes, the biggest loser in the poll, dropped down 12 spots after a loss to the Aggies. So, oh, I'm a little out of breath there. Uh, <laughs> that's the tw- that's the top 25 from this week. Uh, but Timmy, Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish, it, it ain't it ain't too good in the Marcus Some, Freeman somewhere, world. Right somewhere now. down in the hundreds right now, probably. Uh, uh, probably. So, side, side note: breaking news: the Celtics suspended. Emi Adoka for the entire season just announced okay so that so it was just announced okay so that was the breaking news on Thursday night that was the biggest breaking news uh from today we'll save that for the end of the show we'll put a linchpin in that as of right now uh, time codes in the show notes if you want to skip directly to that so but sticking with the top 25 the Notre Dame fighting Irish one and two on the season big season uh a lot of hype in the new Marcus Freeman era, but they're one and two get their first win over Cal. Just barely that Hail Mary catch nearly escaping the grasp of a Cal wide receiver. How are you feeling so far in Marcus Freeman's first full season as head coach of the Notre Dame fighting Irish? Oh, it's, it's very incomplete. I don't like after the Ohio state game, I felt like more like confident than any, you should feel that they're a loss. And with the other people in my life that are Notre Dame fans in which are quite a few that are outside of family members um, that we were talking, you know, we all kind of came to the same agreement. That was, if that was Brian Kelly coaching, they like, they never would have been in that game. Like we probably would have got up blown out like through the start. Um, And the defense was really good in that game to hold a team that, you know, was preseason ranked number two. I know we were ranked number five. Probably shouldn't have been, but, you know, they had all their studs outside of the receivers coming back, but it's not like they had nothing at receiver. They still had like Ohio state is basically receiver you at this point. So it's like they like to leave three more step up 
and you know the yeah, whole Jackson Smith and Jake Jackson right. Jackson Smith and Jigba Marvin Harrison Jr. No slouches. Um, and though and Jigba wasn't he kind of was in and out most of that game. Still, like the whole talk going into that game all summer was those were the two best units. Like, could ND's defense, which is definitely stronger than our offense, stay pace with Ohio State's offense? And for a solid three quarters in like five minutes, they kind of did. And then they kind of just imploded. Obviously, the bigger question was um, they're starting a sophomore who hadn't started a game since like what I think his junior year of high school. Um, when he was chosen, I think everyone that's an Notre Dame fan knew he was going to get the job, even though they're like, oh, it's going to be a quarterback battle in camp. Like everyone knew it was never going to be Drew Pine that got the job. I was never a big fan of Buckner. I, I never really saw what all these coaches and everything saw. But then again, that's the reason they're the coaches and I'm not. Um, but I never really, I just, he, he's got funky mechanics. He doesn't seem like somebody that could be a pure passer. He's a typical, he is a college quarterback for a scheme. Like he would never, ever, even as if he became a great passer and somehow there's no one's ever drafted him to be a, a a quarterback in the NFL most likely um and if they are he's a pet project kind of like Jalen Hurts was but he was more known for his legs than anything else agreed and but like it just kind of it's so disappointing I don't get I don't know how to like feel about Notre Dame because I feel like there's a lot of talent but for whatever reason they just can't tap into it and maybe this is just taking time for like Freeman kind of holding on to the Brian Kelly holdovers, not saying that they're leftovers, but you know, the guys that still stayed there from the Brian Kelly era and it's not his first, you know, full recruiting class that's fully developed. I think the people that are calling for Marcus Freeman to be fired are idiots. They're I think morons. that would be the dumb. It's just, it's such a rat. It's typical rash behavior, but yeah, they're not, like the thing that when we brought Freeman, when Brian Kelly brought Freeman in last year, the first thing he really did was upgrade the recruiting. Like we started to get higher recruits that Brian Kelly wasn't necessarily nailing down all the time. And it wasn't just one or two. It was like four and five at a time. And no, you, you saw, you saw class, some of those, some of those classes, like you just see them. Notre Dame was just stacking on top of it. And it's like, all of a sudden you turn and it's like, Whoa, they got some dogs in this class. Mm-hmm. They've been they've been ranked they were ranked number one or two in the class the Rudy Crewing rankings for 2023 and granted that doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to pan out. Look at Hugh Freeze and Old Miss who got like back to back top five classes and the most they ever got was a Sugar Bowl beatdown with Chad Kelly at quarterback. So like let's not it, it doesn't but it's a step to get the talent in there instead of trying to develop three stars to become five stars, to have the five stars already that have the potential is huge. And then eventually, like we, I think everyone kind of knew it was coming. Keon Keeley uh, decommitted. And back in like February when he, like when Alabama started going after him, which fuck you, Nick Saban, you're such a fucking bitch. Like all you do is bitch about, oh, Texas A&M has more money and oh, this person's doing this and these people are illegal and blah, blah, blah. Except all you fucking do is wait for people to go and offer guys that are three and four stars that rise up to become five stars or high end four stars that you had no interest in whatsoever because you let everyone else do your fucking work for you. And then the second they get an offer and they commit to a school like Notre Dame or even Florida or sometimes now or any of these schools outside of the sec really except some of the like the lower end sec schools um i guess florida does hold on to their own but you know even oklahoma and usc like he waits and then the second they commit he gives it like two months and he's like hey kid would you want to come to alabama possibly i can make you an nfl prospect and then these kids go down and visit and it's like wait i don't have to ever go to class because this is the sec Anyone can say whatever they fucking want. Everyone knows it's true. Uh, unless you go to fucking Vanderbilt, you don't go to class. Like, I'm sorry. It's just, there's no, unless you're an engineering major in Florida, that, that maybe that's it. But like, you, you don't ever really have to care about school. You automatically are going to be on national TV 24 seven. Yes. You have a coach who has nothing but breed first and second round draft picks for the better part of two decades now. Side of that is 
the success rate, I would love for someone to do. I'm just too lazy to go and do it myself. But how many of these players have hit over the years? Because a lot of the defensive players have never really panned out. And he's starting to get a little bit better with the offensive guys hitting in the NFL. But that said, I digress, is that that was everyone kind of knew when Keon Keeley started talking Alabama in February, he was gone. Like it would, it, it, it was, it's surprising it took as long. But that was the one thing with Freeman is that it's like, hey, he's, he's bringing in bigger recruits. Now, they just lost another four-star recruit yesterday, and I think this start isn't necessarily helping the case. What he kind of is going to have to do to hold board is kind of say, hey, guys, you have to understand this isn't my team. When you guys get here and you're my team, this shit ain't happening. Now, defense isn't the issue. Someone I heard someone say, oh, I was listening to Barcel pick them today. Um, I don't bet anything, but I just think the podcast is funny because they just make fun of Rico the whole time, and then Rico gets upset, and I just think it's hilarious. But <laughs> it like, is a, it is a good shtick. It is a very good shtick. But like Rico was like, people were saying Notre Dame's uh, defense is good. It's not very good. It sucks. And I'm like, mm, okay, Rico, you clearly haven't seen shit because the only reason they've been in all three games is because of their defense. Like that's the only they fucking held- reason. That that defense held Ohio State to 21 points in the horseshoe. That's no uh, like the highest scoring offense from last year that returned their stud quarterback in the system, two best running backs. I think they got another transfer running back, and then they had two of their five best running receivers coming back and a complete line. And they held them to essentially seven points through three quarters, and then they got tired because the offense couldn't do anything. So it was like the defense spent ha- most of the game on the on the field. So to get back to your original question 10 minutes ago, how I feel, (laughs) I don't know. Like you could tell me and like, like we could fit, like you could tell me that you jumped to the future and in December, this team finished uh, nine and three and they got a bid to like a high end, like they got a bid to like the cotton bowl or like, they're not getting like a high end bowl. You know what I mean? Like, but it's like, Hey, they're going to the citrus bowl or something again, you know? Yeah, Which, some like mid major bowl that's like kind right, of like scratching it's, New Year's Six, it's but not, not a, exactly. Yeah, it's not it. a New Year's Six bowl, but it's right below it. I mean, or it'd be one of the lower end New Year's Six bowls they somehow sneak into because like all the other teams have already met their tie ins and stuff like that. You could also come back and say it got really bad before it got good and they finished the season strong, but they got blown out by Clemson. They lost by like thir- they lost by like fifteen in North Carolina, and they lost to BYU, and that would be another three on top of it, and they finish six and five or seven and five or whatever, and they're going to like the minor key care bowl in like December twenty sixth. You know what I mean? Like, like it's either yeah, one. No, I, it's, it's I just don't think they're finishing under five hundred. Let me put that they they will finish above five hundred. You can mark that they okay. are finishing above five hundred. There's just talent on that team they have three top three round picks on their defense there's just and and other people in there that, that will fill in behind them and you have the best tight end I don't care what you think Georgia fans it's because you have no one else to throw the ball to and you at least have a quarterback like Rock Bowers is not Michael Mayer I'm sorry he's good Michael Mayer head and shoulders the best tight end in the country and will be a top 15, maybe top 20 pick in this draft. And that is kind of their saving grace right now. I think they finally kind of started to realize they need to run Arjic Estime a lot more and get Chris Tyree a little bit more involved. And I think they've kind of realized, hey, we're going to have to run the ball a lot and then throw a lot less than we wanted to. And it's basically going to be like a lot of Michael Mayer, a lot of running. And one of these other guys is going to have to step up about the middle of the year. And if we can get that going, while well, helping the defense out, we can huddle together like a good record. And the only other game that really scares me is that Clemson game, if they can start to figure it out. But if they go into drill this weekend, the war is absolutely blown off. Seven and five, six, six and six season. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the rest of Notre Dame's schedule. So they got nine games left. They got to face North Carolina this weekend in Chapel Hill. They host BYU. They host Stanford. They host UNLV, then they go to Syracuse, who Syracuse is at this moment off to a very hot start, three and zero. They're frisky. They're going to yeah. definitely get their name problems, especially in the Carrier Dome or whatever the fuck it's called now. Yeah, uh, Clemson. They host Clemson. Clemson comes to South Bend. 
go to Annapolis to play Navy. Uh, Boston, Co- they host Boston College, and then they go to Southern Cal to play USC. Oh, I always I keep forgetting. So, scratch that. What do they have? Twelve games in. That's a twelve game re- season. Yeah, they got to go so, five and. They got to go five and uh, five and four to finish five hundred. So they'll probably scratch that. They'll lose they'll really to get this together. They, they, they'll probably go eight and four. Uh, now that I think about it. Oh wow! I thought you were going in the opposite direction. I thought you were going to go there more. Six oh no! And six. I, I'm I like I know that tennis. I know Clemson is going to no from nine and three. I'm saying they're not going to go oh, nine and three. Like, eight okay. and four is probably the ceiling now. Okay. I, I, I'm I'm forgetting and I, not that we play USC, but I'm just forgetting that USC is good again because Lincoln <laughs> Riley cheated the system. So, um, so. It's 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 painful. The offense is so disjointed. I honestly used to have a lot of faith in Tommy Reese, and I used to think it was Brian Kelly holding him back. And now I just think Tommy Reese probably is the one that has to go. He there there's you can it, it's just, it's just so bad that like you watch the game on the field when the offense is out there. There's no cohe- cohesion. It's very disjointed. It's a lot of um, just everyone kind of standing around. No energy. The plays are getting called and people are just walking up to the line. There's no passion. There's no fire. It's just not what you would think. Even with like even with Jack Cohn in the huddle last year, there was more of like an up tempo, rah rah kind of, hey, let's get this done nature. But like it's almost like they didn't believe in Buckner. Now it's almost like they don't really believe in Drew Pine, although he might have won some of them over with last week because he looked like such shit in that first half until they scored the touchdown at the end of the first half yeah. that it was like so bad. And then I think when the second half got, he started to get a little bit better, started to get through his progressions a little bit better. They started to run the ball more. And I think maybe he might, might've bought some people over in that, uh, in that locker room. So if he can continue to progress, he's never going to be a Heisman trophy winner. He's probably never even going to be like Ian book was at the end of Ian books career, which if you would have, Heard me say that three like three years ago. Me would have heard me say that now. I probably would have kicked myself in the dick. Like you, <laughs> Ian Book. We're talking about the same Ian Book. Like so. Said, not fun. I don't look forward to Saturdays like I thought I was going to this year, and I have yeah. been for the last you know decade plus outside of 2016. Um. I'm nervous about tomorrow because North Carolina scores at will. And uh, what's a Drake May is a stud. Yeah. I just in Chapel Hill, while their fans don't worry me because they're basketball fans. And we know that as North Carolina basketball fans, but I just, it, it, it worries me that uh, it's tomorrow can go one of two ways, either obviously it's either a win or a loss, but it's either that team goes in there, fired up, ready to do what they're going to do. They took practice here this week. Seriously, this week, everyone knows that Drew Pine's the guy. Like, Agnelli's not coming in. Buckner's done for the season. It's Drew Pine or bust now. So we got to get behind him, show him love, show him support, and do everything we can to get him in better situations. Or it's, man, we have no offense. It's all on the defense. This is not how we thought this season was going to go. We're losing the recruits by the minute. What are we going to do? People are calling for Marcus's job. People are calling for Tommy Reese's job. Al Golden isn't doing what we thought he was going to do as a veteran D coordinator presence. Fuck it. You know what? All I care about is my draft stock now. I'm out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And tomorrow is going to be the predictor of how. You mean Saturday? Season, or Saturday, sorry. is going to be the predictor of how. Well, tomorrow this season by the time this comes out. Uh, yeah, true. You're thinking it's in bad the future. When I look for, it's bad when I look forward to Air Force better more than Notre Dame right now. Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, so that's thoughts on Notre Dame fighting Irish with Timmy Gorman. Uh, so let's move on to the Penn State Nittany Lions. This is the most excited I've really been as a Penn State fan in my infancy of a, being a Penn State fan. Uh, so far this season, and I the will non-Penn admit- State fan said one thing real quick, and then I'll let you go. Go ahead, I go was, ahead. And you know how it's not the team; it's the fans that I can't stand. Correct, I get it. Yep, the Kool Aid and everything like that. But watching them go into 
Go down there on the plains and absolutely shit kick Auburn <laughs> for <laughs> four quarters. Half chub, even though it was Penn State. I was like, this is fucking awesome. This is it's so awesome. great. Just to it's watch been... the SEC team get bent over a table ruthlessly in their own fucking house. And then even more so was that clip on Instagram that I sent you was that which the guy was like, Welcome to SEC country, uh, oh, Sean yeah. And it's like, yeah, the score is twenty one seven, bro. Welcome to SEC country, like, and bro, it's one thing. It's it's one thing if an SEC team like Alabama, Georgia, LSU is talking shit, but Auburn fans, shut up, shut up. Cam Newton and Chris Davis returning the kick six was the last time you were relevant, and all and Penn State with Nicholas Singleton. Who is looking like a legitimate oh, a era, pa- era apparent to that Saquon, Miles Sanders, Kurt Warner running back, uh, legendary Curtis mantle? Enos. Exactly. There's so many names that I'm forgetting. Listen, I just started being a Penn State fan. Okay. Don't kill me. I'm just starting to get the hang of this thing. Put a plug in that SEC comment too, because when you're done, sorry, I have a comment no, about what you're saying about Alabama and Georgia to follow up with my thoughts. Like, and you'll agree, we talked about this, but. <laughs> Sorry, can, can continue. Also, you have a LaSalle alum playing middle linebacker for, for them, right? Do we? Oh my god, I think we the stud the stud the stud freshman like linebacker. Right? Oh yeah. Why am I blanking on his name? I'm blanking on his name. I know exactly who you're talking about. I'll give him a shout out in post-production. Um, but we all know that this and it does you don't have to be a Penn State fan to know that this team ride or dies with Sean Clifford and how he performs. And I'll admit, I was very hard on Sean Clifford throughout last season, two seasons ago. And now I'm kind of coming around on why Franklin has consistently start, stuck with him and started him. The biggest difference between this year and last year, number one, health. I think that rib injury or whatever he had was so much worse than obviously than he or Franklin is ever going to let on because, of course, why would they ever let on a the severity of an injury that just helps the other team out number two the supporting cast all due respect to Jahan Dotson um, and even Parker Washington last year and Brenton Strange and Kevon Lee all those starters from last year and some and those guys three of those guys Strange uh, Kevon Lee um, and uh, Dotson I mean Dotson and it fell but two of those guys in Strange and Kevon Lee are still here. Parker Washington still here. Those guys have taken such a huge step in development that this is a completely different supporting cast almost compared to last season. And I think with combine that with Sean Clifford's experience, his leadership, that two minute drive against Purdue in week one really lit a spark of belief that this team can win in big moments and that Sean Clifford can really take them over the top. And we're seeing that that confidence, that swagger is just oozing out of this team. And I love it. I love it so much. The defense, Jair Brown is flying all over the field. Chop Robinson had some big, big plays against Auburn. I think he forced a fumble uh, Abdul Carter, Abdul Carter. That's who it is. I was just about to say it. I looked it up for you. No, I didn't Thank want you. to interject again though. <laughs> Thank you. Abdul Carter. Uh, shout out to Abdul Carter. He's, he's flying all over the field and he could be the next great Penn state linebacker to come out of state college. Who he's knows? Big boy. Jesus. Massive boy, massive boy would not want to fuck with him at all. Um, and so combine all you got, that. What's his name? You got, what's his name? Son too. Don't forget about him. Joey Porter jr. Joey Porter Jr., the the King, uh, the King twins, uh, they've really helped that secondary out tremendously. So when I'm looking at all Penn State's talent, I said this to someone last night. I said this to one of my roommates. I truly believe that Penn State can at least contend for a New Year's Six Bowl, if not a college football playoff spot. We're three weeks in. Michigan has been known to fall off either midway through the season or late in the season. It's obviously going to come down to those games against Michigan in the big house and at Ohio state. Those two will be the key turning points of the season. And as of right now, I am very confident that this Penn state team can go into Ann Arbor, can host Ohio state in happy Valley and can beat both of those teams straight up. 
We talked about uh, the Notre Dame Ohio State game earlier. I'm not necessarily sold on Ohio State's defense really dominating like we've seen in past years. Like that defense. Well, and they sucked last year too. And that was the big thing. And everyone's like, they're back. And it's like, no, they're not. Like we just discussed, Notre Dame's offense sucks. And on top of that, I will say, Michigan hasn't played dick yet. Like they ha- they haven't even. Oh, left they're out ever, of conference. Ske- uh, no, they're out of conference schedule is absolutely ridiculous. It's an atrocity. Ooh, you beat Hawaii, but had them come to the big house to beat them. You know who else beat Hawaii? Vanderbilt. Hawaii. Beat them by more than Michigan did. So, if I'm not mistaken. So here, here's uh, I Michigan. Think Penn State has the best win by far. Is what I was gonna say. For sure, I think it's the best quality win. It, they deserve to be number fourteen. I think you could even make an argument that Arkansas looked very sloppy, and you could have slotted Penn State above Arkansas into the top ten if you really wanted to do that. So Michigan's out of a schedule so far has been Colorado State, Hawaii, and UConn. Those have been the first three games, and that's just their out-of-conference schedule. And none of now, them have a win. No. <laughs> and, and you're looking at the next few games. I don't games. think they do anyway. I don't I think any of those teams have a win. UConn. I know Colorado. Colorado oh, UConn, UConn is one and three. They do beat the Little Sisters of the Poor. Probably. Or the equivalent of it, which is probably Vanderbilt. But uh, Whoa, hey, hey, hey. You watch this. Two <laughs> and one. <laughs> They beat oh they beat they're Central three, Connecticut one, they beat sorry. another they beat another Connecticut school it looks like they beat Central Connecticut State University uh, which no, I didn't know yeah. was that sounds made it, up but apparently that's a school no they they're like that's who Don I think that's who Danielle Marshall coaches their basketball program that's a poll anyway back to Michigan they host they got a Mar- funny nickname that's all I remember yes yeah, so Michigan it. gets to host its first four games they host Maryland next one. And then they go to Iowa. They go to Bloomington, Indiana. And then they come to host Penn State, Michigan State. And then go to Rutgers, host Nebraska, host Illinois, and then go to Ohio State. So I, the fact that Michigan can schedule this is ridiculous. It's absolutely atrocious. Whereas Penn State hasn't. It's SEC scheduling. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah, it's SEC exactly. scheduling. Which, if Penn State was doing this, I'd be all for it. I'm Hippocrates, bitch. I would be all for that shit, and I would totally be defending it. But if it's anybody besides Michigan or Ohio State, if that was, like, Wisconsin or Minnesota, and they were, and people had them, like, and the people were like, dude, Minnesota scored, like, 97 points, only went up, like, 10, and they're 3-0, and and blah, 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 everyone would be like, yeah, but who have they played? Like, they haven't even left home yet. And it's like, so you mean they have pulled an Alabama? Now, granted, uh, Alabama did play Texas this year. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a, that's a but key But that's like, difference. what's that, the first time they've actually played a real out-of-conference opponent that yeah, means and, shit in how long? And as much as on paper it says uh, number 11 Oregon versus number three Georgia at a neutral site game, that was right. in the Atlanta Falcons Stadium in Atlanta, yeah, that's Georgia. Not, that's, no. not, that's not – that's a, not a – yeah, that's that was a home game. So I, I am ecstatic. I know some people that go to Auburn and they were talking some shit on social media. And to see 42 to 14 on that that scoreboard, Penn State fans took over that stadium too towards the end. It was a great weekend. Nicholas Wait, Singleton. You, like you know, people from here that go to Auburn, like from Pennsylvania, yeah. that yeah. What is with that? What is with this like love now all of a sudden for kids from our area to be like we got to go to the SEC school. Like, I don't uh, understand that. Well, for one, for my generation, for my year specifically, it was probably like COVID vaccination stuff. Like SEC schools not necessarily requiring you to be vaccinated. Yeah, that's true. And also, uh, there's they're definitely chasing some tail. I'm not going to lie. I would not be surprised if that know. was part I, of the reason. I get that, but it's just like, like I don't – it's like you're not, it's not, you're not getting a great education unless you're going to Vanderbilt, as we've already established. But these are the type and, of kids that aren't necessarily prioritizing education right. when they're looking at college. I'm saying, like, so I just don't understand why you just want to stick with Penn State. It's, I don't get like it's it's a completely different life now. Like they, we live two different lives in this country exactly. compared more well, more than that because the wet out west is a completely different life too. And then in the middle, like you know, but I just I never like that's I, I've noticed that it's a new thing, and it's like. Yeah, it'd be cool to go to like an SEC football game and stuff, but it's like I'd never fucking want to go to one of those schools unless yeah. I act unless I was smart enough to get into Vandy 
That's about yeah, it. Van, Vandy would be the only, I think Vandy, maybe you could probably convince me LSU. LSU looks like a fun town. Oh no, the town fun seemed school. fun. Like Athens and like, and stuff like that. It's just like, I don't, I just. You're talking about strictly yeah. education and like actual like. Yeah. College. And now like I got the greatest education going to state college. And, like, but I did, you know, Drexel was a solid school and I went there for a year, but you know, couldn't afford it anymore. But it's like, I don't know. I just wouldn't like. I'm not like, oh, I go there because it's a football team. Like, no, like if I'm going to Vandy, I would be going to Vandy for the ed. Like, if you're going down there for that education. See, that's and because Nash- Nashville's a side is a, a huge bonus on top of it. Your parents had, and that means your parents instilled good values in you, Timmy. That's a good sign. Uh-huh. Yeah, this generation, no offense, but your generation doesn't really have that anymore because they were handed everything. They got a trophy for wiping their ass every time they did it. I would like to point. I think I only held on to one participation trophy. I would just like to. I'm not that. saying you. I'm saying <laughs> the majority no, of I'm your joking. generation. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, don't don't even get me started on the Instagram influencer epidemic and all that type of stuff. Um, but Penn State, their ceiling is a college football playoff appearance. National championship is going to be very tough. I've tried to look at a different angle of could Penn State catch georgia or alabama or maybe usc sneaks into the top four and they take one of these powerhouses by surprise and went and go on a magical run and win a national championship first time since joe paterno has been head coach i maybe maybe but it all depends on sean clifford and singleton georgia's just, defense georgia's defense scares think, the hell out of me yeah i don't think clifford can do it as good as Singleton is, he's a stud. I just don't. So what about this situation? To, what about what about Alar? Counterpoint. Right? Counterpoint. So let's say hypothetically, not wishing this on on Sean Clifford. Sean Clifford exits the game early. Don't know why. Undisclosed reason. Goes to the medical tent. Drew Aller comes in, limited film, and he just comes in and starts slinging it all over the field. Is that a situation that could happen? Do you think? No, because I still think he's as as good as I think he is. Is from what all like my friends that are Penn State, like my one buddy who's like really knows what he's talking about, and I trust. Um, my my buddy Mayor, like he's he's told like he like I believe him when he says like this kid's a real deal, and I believe you yeah. when you say it. But I also like Mayor is like yeah, but like he's not as much as we want him in there now because Clifford sucks he probably would like would get eaten up a little bit. He He's not as ready as uh, we, raw. you know, he's, he's not, very raw. He is. He's a little raw. So, but that's fair. It, it gives you Hope. very big things to look forward to because you haven't had that kind of quarterback. And I mean, McSorley was never that kind of quarterback, but you, you trusted McSorley because exactly. he was a gamer. Exactly. He wasn't, he was, he wasn't like the, the Bryce young, kind of guy but he was the he's the Stetson Bennett you you trust him and you knew he was going to get it done for you exactly so that those are my thoughts on Penn State uh any other closing remarks before we move on to the Eagles so yeah the SEC thing as we were as we as you said so here's this is my and because for years I've I've always argued against it like everyone's like well the SEC is the best the SEC is the best and I always argued against it and I'm like how and this is before teams like Mississippi State and Arkansas. Well, this is like this is right around the time that like Arkansas started to get bad when the whole everyone started blowing the SEC and ESPN started going haywire with it when Saban got to Alabama when he started winning natties, right? And I just, just like I'm like, how like, like oh they have the toughest schedule, blah 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 blah. And I'm like, Mississippi State and Mississippi and Arkansas and Kentucky. And South Carolina, well, South Carolina was a little was decent back then, but I'm like, all these schools go fucking seven and six, eight and five every year. How are they any better than like the Ohio States or back then the USC's and Oregon's of the world that Alabama could be playing? Oh, well, the reason their 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 record is that bad is that because they play in the SEC and everyone beats up on each other. And I'm like, no, the reason they're that bad is because they're not fucking good. And I just I I I hate the whole conference like role that comes with and it's not just them like other conferences do it but they are the king abusers of it SEC SEC and the teams that do that are the teams that don't win shit okay 
they are the teams that have never won anything, that are never going to win anything when it comes to football. And when they, if they have, it's back when they didn't have black players playing against white players. It's before segregation. Okay? So, <laughs> that said, it's like, you look at the SEC. Yes, Alabama, for the last 15, to 15 years, has been the best program in college football. I hate to say it, but it's so true. You can't deny the truth. So, they have whatever, what, do they have five, six titles or something like that? Don't they have seven? I thought he, like, passed Jordan seven. or something. It might, it might be seven. So I'll keep going. I'll, I'll look. Yeah, so, so then Georgia has their one. Florida has – Florida and LSU both have three. This is going back to 2000, by the way. Sorry. I should have prefaced that. This is from 2000 on, like, two years after the BCS was created when it really started to become – what it is, what, what college football is now. So in that time, Alabama, so that's, that's 22, that's 22 national championships, basically give her 21 or 22. Alabama has six or seven Florida and LSU both have three. Georgia has one. Um, Auburn has one. And I'm missing somebody. I'm I'm looking at uh since 2000, LSU. Who am I won, missing? LSU won in 03 and 2019. No, 07, 03, 07, 2019. Oh, Les Miles has one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I missed that one. Okay. Uh, Alab- t- Alabama t- is. Alabama won in 09, 9. 2011, 2012, 2015, 2017, and 2020. That's so six. Yeah. Six. So um, six, three. Florida's got their their no, sorry, Florida's got two. Florida has 2006 and 2008. 2008. Texas, Auburn's got two. Th- Texas has 05. Because they won it as they won it as the SC, in the Big 12. And they're not in the SEC yet. Oh, fair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Duh. yeah I'm just counting the current team. So so then yeah. uh so then Florida has O O six and O eight. Auburn has 11. Georgia has 2022 or 2021. Yeah. And that's it, right? Yeah, because the other ones are Clemson, Ohio State, Florida State. uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, uh, USC. um, And that's pretty much – and Miami in 01. Right. I feel like I'm missing somebody that I'm – so – it's Alabama with six, Florida with three, with three, Florida with LSU with three, Florida with two, Georgia with one, and Auburn with one. Auburn with one. So yeah. that's so you add you, so that's thirteen. Okay, so great, great. Yeah, it's unbelievable. You hear run. me say, Mississippi State, South Carolina, Kentucky, Vandy. And I should exclude Vandy because they never really do that SEC thing in any sport. They're, they they refuse to acknowledge it. Tennessee, Mississippi, none of these schools, but they're the first ones to be like, the SEC, the SEC, this, this. And, and it's like, all right, folks, your school hasn't won dick in anything, especially football. And if you really want to start counting shit, the SEC is the best because they probably are when it comes to every sport because baseball, they're just as good as football. Then after Alabama, Vanderbilt is probably the next biggest thing when it comes to baseball and how good they are at that. So, but that said, though, none of these other schools have won dick, but they're the first ones to be like, the SEC is so great. And it's like, I just wish someone outside of Danny Cannell because he's, he, he's so, it's so tired at this point, but I just wish someone would come out and be like, the sec thing like you're 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 not you haven't contributed anything your teams haven't contributed anything you each have maybe one or two good seasons mississippi state has the dak prescott year uh mississippi has the two good years under hugh freeze uh well and Ol- south well, carolina Ole miss, has hold on, hold on. Ole miss has had last year they had a really good season with matt Corral. Oh, right 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 sorry yes but i'm saying now yes kiffin is getting them um, and and Leach is going to make them more – is going to make, what's it called, more Mississippi State a bigger draw. And San, and Pittman has brought Arkansas back to a very relevant state. So, yeah. yes, I get it now. 
but still no this is anything yeah and to use to use a a, a soccer a conference analogy. titles at this point <laughs> yeah no i get what you're saying i agree with you i this is like if the if in the champions league like swansea cities was doing like an epl chant when against like syria a and it's like you guys haven't won anything. Why are you talking shit about like how the EPL is superior to Syria? I'm not saying that's right. I'm very uneducated in soccer. No, no, no it's a good no. It is. It's it's like saying like it like well a better one would be like Tottenham being like oh like the EPL is the best and it's all this and all that. It's like really Tottenham because what have you ever won anything outside of the cup, the League Cup, which is the uh, like the joke cup for English football? Like you know what I mean? Or it'd be like the it'd be like Valencia. In or like in, in Spain, being like, yeah, La Liga is so good, and it's like, yeah, you're not Atletico, Barcelona, or Real. You can't even say you're at that point who has won uh, four Europa leagues, which is pretty good on in its own case. And then it's like even like the Bundesliga to be like the Bundesliga, and it's like, yeah, everyone outside of Dortmund and Bayern, shut up. So yeah, no, you're exactly, 100. Yeah. It wouldn't. What are these Swansea? Because I don't, they're, they're still in the, they're not in the EPL anymore, just, but yes. The, the only reason I say that is because I have a friend who's a big Swansea or was a big Swansea fan in high school. Uh, and we just bust his balls all day about for being it's a Swansea. random team they get behind. Yeah. Don't get me started. Um, So let's, let's, we've closed the chapter on college football, NFL, the Philadelphia Eagles, Jalen Hurts, possibly the guy. I mean, I don't uh, – if anyone still doubts Jalen Hurts, I still don't get it. As Timmy holds up his miraculous Jerome Brown jersey, go Birds, go Birds. And perhaps the most vindicating win since probably the 2018 Super Bowl that I can remember at least uh, off the top of my head. The Philadelphia Eagles crushed the Minnesota Vikings 24-7 to on Monday Night Football to go 2-0 and on the season. Darius Slay. Turns back the clock in, uh, in a way that I didn't think was possible, honestly, when we got him um, and really have seen him play. But him and James Bradbury, whoo, buddy. That even, is a, cool. even Avante Maddox was great on Monday. Avante Maddox had that snatch of, of a pick in the fourth. I believe it was the fourth quarter. He just went up and got it. He said, give me that, and just snatched it. So according to Pro Football Focus, Darius Slay and James Bradbury rank in the top five of lowest passer rating allowed. Bradbury allows a negative 7.0 and Darius Slay a negative 25.2. So passer rating goes down by seven points uh, with James Bradbury on the field and Darius Slay uh, 25.2 when uh, quarterbacks throw his way. Darius Slay against Justin Jefferson. We thought Justin Jefferson possibly an MVP candidate, but did that? Ah! Darius Slay said, hey, "How about that? I don't know about that. <laughs> hold, Six, hold my beer. Hold my beer real quick. I'm about to go crush this thing. Go grab some Rita's water ice and head home and crush some Bud Lights with the boys. Dilly dilly. He six targets to Justin Jefferson. Only one catch. Two interceptions and a zero point zero passer rating. But we all know the story of this game. Jalen Hurts, the enigma of the NFL." 0 for 5 in a week one first drive against the Detroit Lions. How does he come out? How does Nick Sirianni draw it up? A beautiful 5 for 5. 63 yards and one rushing touchdown on the first drive in week two. And his total stats, even better. 26 for 31 on completion percentage. Accuracy, check. 333 passing yards. Airing it out to a 53-yard bomb to Quez Watkins, check. 10.7 yard per 10.7 to 10.7 shit oh no i lost you oh there you go we're good we're good we're, we're hanging in there four different eagle receivers racked up over 60 receiving yards in this game dallas goddard led the way five recep- five catches 82 yards Devontae smith seven catches 80 yards quez watkins two receptions for 69 yards nice and a touchdown A.J. Brown, five catches, 69 yards. Nice again. No touchdowns for A.J. Brown. But that's a good thing because that means we're spreading the ball out a little bit more. So those are all my stats that I prep for today. Hell of a promo by me, if I if I do say so myself. Um, 
Don't forget I, Miles just, Sanders is, is averaging almost 94 yards from scrimmage. I get, I forget, and, I think over the first two games. And, and coming off a week when four different Eagles score a rushing touchdown, they have an, a, an airing out festival. It, this was exactly what the type of win that the Eagles needed. Jalen Hurts right now is sitting, I believe, according to FanDuel, I have to double check these odds. According to FanDuel, Jalen Hurts is entering this week uh, with the third best odds to win M. Please, fucking word, please. We good? All MV- right. All right. I hear you now. Third best so odds Jaylen- to win MVP, I'm assuming. Yes, so Jalen Hurts, third best odds to win M- NFL MVP behind Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson entering this weekend. So, did Jalen Hurts, huh? Why Lamar? Did he really I have that great of two weeks? Let me double. This is why I I, I was I'll look looking it up, up. Real quick. I'll look it up. I'm also looking it up. But I, if Jalen Hurts ever needed to uh, paint a masterpiece to show why he should be the franchise guy, this is his Picasso. This is his Michelangelo. This is his Renaissance 16 Chapel all that good stuff that I learned in Catholic school that I don't really remember much of until this very moment. So I, if you're the Eagles, you have to seriously consider how much money you're going to give Jalen hurts now, because you're by all accounts, this completely erased whatever doubts that I had in week one, he answered the bell. He took what the defense gave him. The receivers were dicing the secondary up because for whatever reason, the Vikings decided to play back in the shell coverage and just let the Eagles receivers feast in open space, which made zero sense to me. And Jalen Hurts did what he needed to do. He took advantage. He launched that bomb to Quez Watkins. And if I'm Howie Roseman, I'm already drawing up what the contract's going to look like moving forward for uh, Jalen Hurts. But Timmy, is did this do enough to show that Jalen Hurts is the guy moving forward? Uh, real quick, first of all, the MVP odds currently as they sit: Josh Allen one, Mahomes two, Hurts wow. three. Josh Allen plus three fifty, Mahomes plus five hundred, Hurts plus eight hundred, Justin Herbert four plus a thousand, Lamar at is uh, number five at plus twelve hundred, and Burrow somehow is still sitting there. It's in sixth place at plus 2,000, which makes no sense to me. I mean, not that I don't think yeah. I'll recover, but to still be that high is, is weird. That said, um, I'm, not, I think I'm excited. Definitely am. Uh, I was definitely a little nervous going into Monday night. And then the team clearly wasn't reading their clippings from the offseason and how over the last like month plus prior to the season – there started to be this whole wave of like, I think the Eagles are the favorite for the NFC East and could probably make a run to the Super Bowl. And I think it got every Eagles fan, which is to say pretty much every Eagles fan and in, in the, in this area anywhere nervous, like, Oh shit. No, that's not, no, 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 go away. No, we don't want you to believe in us. Like we're the underdog. And we, we always like that better. We hate when people start to like, like, like us because we think, that it's like a hex almost. That said, week one comes around. You know, they do their thing, probably give up a little bit too much, too many points. Um, as it's looking like now, though, the Lions aren't doesn't don't look like a slouch. That uh the, um what's it called? Uh hard knocks boost is for real. Right. I think anyone yeah. can can if you go back and look at all the teams that have been on hard knocks, I'd love to see how many because usually they, they pick a team that wasn't really that good the year before I'd love to see how many of those teams have improved the record because it's got to be it's got to be on the higher end really and, I think it was the opposite because it felt like for me at least the last few years like the last half decade it's been like eh, I don't know about that like maybe you can look it up or maybe find a stat but maybe it, it was I, just more so back in the day when it first yeah, um, yeah, because there was a there was a stretch there, and even I think McAfee talked about it uh, when it was the lead up to this season of Hard Knocks was that like there there was I, at least for me as a football fan I was like I wasn't really interested in Hard Knocks be, just because with all the access to like YouTube where teams are posting more behind the scenes content than ever before that Hard Knocks wasn't necessarily a must watch, and they were picking teams like Jameis Winston's Tampa Bay Bucks in like 2017. Uh, the Houston Texans, 
and I think 2018, it was like the Rams with Goff. Uh, I think it was before the Super Bowl, if I remember correctly. Um, and there was just a, a stretch there where it's like, uh, 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 th- this team isn't probably going to do anything, so why would I watch it? But anyway. So the, Ram- the Rams in 16, the Bucks in 17 – or probably yeah they they uh, this is like this isn't really the most updated one so in 09 the Bengals went from 411 and 1 the previous season to 10 and 6 in the playoffs in oh, 2010 the Jets went from 9 and 7 to 11 and 5 it doesn't really count because they made the AFC championship game both years there was nothing in 11 because of the strike in 2012 the Dolphins went from 6 and 10 to 7 and 9 no playoffs but still an improvement and 13, the Bengals once again, but they, they, this is when they had a really good stretch for like five years. They improved by one game, but they were, like I said, they, they were in the playoffs anyway already. 14, the Falcons uh, won two more games. They went from four and 12 to six and 10. The Texans stayed the same at nine and seven and 15. Ram, as I said, Rams and Bucks in 16 and 17 uh, regressed. The Browns went from 0 and 16 to 7, 8 and 1 and 18. And then okay. in 2019, the Raiders went from four and twelve to seven and nine. Okay, and I then, was I was completely wrong. I was completely and if wrong. You, I think you perception. even go back even further, maybe a couple of years before that. But the Bengals were the first one that I really remember the hard knocks boost kind of starting to exist for because both years they were on it, they improved the next year. Um, and so the reason we say that is that everyone's like, Oh, well, the Eagles gave up this to the Lions, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, in my book, the way I read that is that's just anybody trying like jumping on the opportunity to take a shit, take a shot at the Eagles. Like, yeah, because exactly. especially like Bill Simmons, cause it's like, Oh, well they're getting too much hype now. I want to, you know, it's like fucking go cry and piss and moan that your Patriots aren't going to be good this year. You know what I mean? So that said, um, we found out this, this past week that the line, it's not just us, the lions are frisky. And even though the commanders might not be that good, the lions, you know, went out and put a hurting on them, which is if they're not good and the lions are supposed to be good, that's what you do. Right. So then all week we're leading into this game and it's Monday Night Football and Justin Jefferson is becoming the best receiver in the NFL and, and the whole narrative, how did Howie not pick him over Rager and it's something we're going to have to live with for years and every time, you know, it's just one of those things and everything, we're just constantly thinking about it, thinking about it. And it's like, man, I hope they don't come out flat. I hope they don't come out flat. And that they, that that coin toss comes. And you could tell from that coin toss alone, if you go back and rewatch it, they were ready. It's like, nope, we're taking the ball. We have a game plan. It wouldn't surprise me if some of those they, – they had scripted the first seven to ten plays, the old Charlie Weiss script the first 15 plays move that he used to do at Notre Dame. Um, they, as you said, he started out against the Lions. Jalen Hurts at 0-5. Then he went 5-5 five and five this drive. It's the best I've ever seen Jalen Hurts play a game, college, pros, anything. That first drive was so impressive by him. He kept his poise. He didn't let the penalties get to him. He made a couple really big throws. Everyone's talking about the bomb, the Quez. Great throw. Hit him on the money. It was a really good spiral, everything like that. And then there was another throw to Quez, I think, in like the third that he made running to his left. He hit him, but it got called back from a penalty. That was a really nice one. And there was one more, I believe. To me, uh, Jalen Hurts' most impressive throw of the night was that first drive. Back-to-back penalties. All the momentum is getting stunned. They're at midfield, third and like 17 or something like that. Or no, it was like third and 14. He stays in the pocket. He's getting some heat. He stays there. Plants his back foot, steps up, fires an absolute fucking strike to A.J. Brown, 19 yards down the field in between three Vikings players. Brown, of course, secures it. Wrestles them, goes down, gets maybe another yard. First down, move the sticks, keeps the drive going. We end up scoring, momentum set. That is a throw that Jason Hurts never, ever, 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 ever would have made in his career prior to this year. To see him be like, man, these fucking penalties, it took away two really good calls for us, two really good plays. Nah, he went back in there, was like, all right, all right, all right, fine, we got this. You could see it was like, all right, here's the play. Sat there, pocket collapsing, stops, steps, and just rifles it. He throws a Tom Brady rifle 19 yards up the field to his receiver in coverage, hits him, never got phased. And that I, that throw is what I think set the tone. Not that it wasn't already set, but it really helped establish it for the rest of the game. And like 
you know, it, it's it's great. A very positive. It's a little concerning. We didn't score in the second half, um, but at the same time, it's not like it's not because like the offense wasn't clicking. It was just more so, you know, they had the field goal block, and then it was kind of just like it was like we did a couple things, but then I felt like we spent more time on defense in the second half than anything. No, we definitely definitely did, and I think it, after the blocked field goal. And I think once the Eagles defense stopped them from the Vikings from scoring, even then um, it was like, Oh, it almost doesn't matter if we score. Cause we know our defense is just going to back us up. Yeah. Primetime Kirk has showed up and he's ready to throw the ball to anyone that isn't a Viking. <laughs> yeah. He's ready so, to throw to the opposite jerseys. You know, so it was, it was such a, like it's week two and we got, you know, it's like, let's stay calm. Let's, because Jalen Hurts could probably still regress back. He's probably going to have a bad game or two at some point. For sure. You know, it's just bound to happen. Even the good people, even the greats have bad games every now and then. But if he's going to show up and play like that every week, defense is going to play the way that they played, and Jonathan Gannon's actually going to call a real defensive game and not that bullshit he called. Because what the Vikings did on Monday night where they just sat in that, like, that shell – and it's allowed yeah. the underneath routes and the middle routes to us 24-7 is equivalent to what Jonathan Gannon did against the Lions where he refused to check out of that 4-2-5 scheme. I think he sat in it like 99% of the time, and that's the reason we got gashed on the ground by the Lions so badly. And then, you know, they got gashed on the ground, and then Jared Goff made a couple really big throws, and they had some nice catches, and that's what led to the, that game being as close as it was. But he clearly woke the fuck up and whatever needed to be said to him was said. And he came prepared with a great game plan. Big game, big game slay, turn the clock talk, ugh, turn the clock back. And like you, I when we got him, I'm like, cool. We have a lot of other holes. So what's having Daily Slay really gonna do for us? He wasn't great his first year, was a, definitely better last year. And so far, after these first two games, looks like he kind of took it personal, all the shit that people were saying about him, and he looks like he's ready to play like he's 28 again instead of, what, he's like 32, something like yeah, that? Yeah, early or? 30s. Um, yeah. So looking ahead to this Washington game, I'm very excited because this could be the Carson Wentz ass-kicking game to really just like – Is that a smidge at, of nervousness, though? Like it's like this it, is where it, somehow he gets his revenge? Yeah, because – it's like Russian to make fun of yeah, everyone gets to make fun of us about how Carson Wentz went and beat us and everything like that. Well, you know what, what I mean? scares me, what scares me is a guy like Jahan Dotson. I mean, it, and how he can just fly all over the field. That is, that oh, is my it, well, no, they, it, it's not just him. It's, it's McLaurin and Curtis Samuel who's healthy and has had two monster weeks so far. But I feel, I feel bad for a guy like McLaurin because Carson Wentz literally in that last game, he somehow threw and fumbled the ball at the same time. Did you see that clip against the Lions? No, I'll send it. It's Carson Wentz. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, this is, these are the people that are throwing the ball to Terry McLaurin. And so Terry McLaurin, I feel, I feel bad for him. And I just think the defense is clicking on all cylinders. And Wentz may, Wentz will have a couple of good throws. I'm not expecting the defense to pitch a seven point. Uh, basically like a one-hit shutout equivalent in football. I'm not expecting that. I think it'll be like probably – my score prediction is probably like 28-17-ish. Uh, I think that's probably where I'm landing. I think Dotson rips off a couple of big plays, and but I still think the offense stays clicking, and I would not be surprised if Sirianni goes to a more controlled, conservative ground attack in order to keep the fans, whatever fans that are still in that fucking stadium, uh, out of the out of the game and allow the Eagles fans that will travel down to Washington, D.C. It's, for that it, game. There was some stat that it's like 50-50. I think at this point it's going to be 50-50 with the amount of tickets and bus pit, like things that have been sold. It, uh, it's also they have, a decent, they have a decent line, defensive yeah. line, yeah, which you sure. should when you draft like seven straight <laughs> – <laughs> first round de defensive lineman finally you know shit should pan out right so yeah I, that, that I, it would be would wouldn't surprise me if he kind of changes it up a little bit and he's like well you're all expecting us to do this so let's hit you with the run my bigger thing outside of Dotson is they've really got to look at Samuel he, he's healthy he's mm -hmm. been really great these first two weeks 
he but his average catch is like a yard because he's getting a lot of bubble screens and like one yard hitch or like two yard like hitch routes that he's just so, running out catching and then and then they're setting it up for him to this use his speed afterwards and Avante Maddox is going to have to be very very aware of that the slot and pay attention to not only what Samuel's doing and what his pre-snap motion is but where who at where other people are because if he's moving Monty's going to have to be aware, like, all right, is there a tight end on that side that could possibly clip me off? Is, yeah. Are they moving a fullback out? Are they crashing down on the corner, Jahan Dotson, to give him a little bit of that? You know what I mean? He's going to yeah. have to be very aware of that. And Bradbury, uh, Chauncey, and Slay are going to have to help out too. And our linebackers are going to really have to come to play and understand that they're going to have to converge on all these little short yardage plays because I think they've kind of figured out, hey, as long as we're not having Carson throw the ball 10 yards downfield every play, little fucking screen plays could help. For sure. I think that's I think I think that's what their offensive coordinator has kind of has figured out now that Samuel's healthy and you have Dotson who's speedy too. And it's like take away the big plays downfield by making them in the backfield. You know what I mean? So it's it's gonna be a little bit score, of a different test. Score prediction. We're in what? Yeah, we're down there. Yeah. I think we score more points this week than last week, but only because I think the I think Washington sticks in it a little bit longer than the Vikings did. I'm gonna go uh, uh, 31-17. 31-17. All right, I got twenty eight seventeen. So we'll see uh, how that game turns out. All right, we're gonna quickly instead of doing real or fake. Uh, we're going to do just quick picks for this week and then get to some of the NBA news that's kind of come out in the last few hours. Uh, so we're just going to quickly run through these. Pittsburgh and Cleveland is going on right now. Cleveland's got the lead 23 to 14 with five and a half minutes to go. Pittsburgh has the ball uh, on their own 13 yard line. Uh, so that's why we're not picking this game. Uh, Houston at Chicago. Who do you have? Uh, actually, I like Houston. I think they've been pretty uh quick, fun. quick. Let's yeah. add, i think houston's i think houston's better than people thought they're gonna be they're they got a decent defense uh davis mills is really the only thing holding them back i don't think chicago is anything special and uh i could see houston going in there and upsetting chicago and they can get in their first one of the season i'll take chicago because no one knows how to play on a shittier field like sh- the chicago bears <laughs> it's true uh raiders at titans uh, Vegas, they need to get off the snide. I think they come out, and this is a big Devontae Adams game. They they go and feed him 24-7, get him going, and uh, I think they just keep laying on the misery on the Titans. Agreed. I think Vegas uh, comes out on that one. Uh, Kansas City at Indianapolis, Kansas City. I got Kansas City here. I think Indy makes it a little bit closer than than you would think, but, yeah, I think Kansas City goes in there. Uh, on turf and and Mahomes has at least five touchdowns. I would not be surprised. Buffalo at Miami, big two AFC East contenders in this one. Which way are you going here? Uh, I think Miami is going to get exposed for the frauds they are. And I think Buffalo, like everyone's jumping for joy. Like, oh my God, can you believe it? Well, the Ravens already have half a defense again. So like, let's calm down guys. Like he, Tua still looked like shit in the first half. So yeah, I, I think, the class of the AFC that might be the class of the NFL right now. Um, I just think the only thing that could get in their way is the humidity, but I think they go out there, they trounce on them early in the first half, and maybe Miami makes it a little bit more respectable in the second, but it's out of hand at that point. Bills, I got Bills. Stefan Diggs looks like 08 Kobe, or 08, like oh, not even 08, like 05 to 08 Kobe, where he has an eye to just rack up points in a hurry. But he still obviously at, wants the team to win. At this point, if Josh Allen doesn't win the MVP, something terribly is going to have to go wrong, I feel like. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Detroit at Minnesota. Uh, I think the Lions continue the momentum and go into Minnesota and really expose Minnesota for not really having much depth like the Eagles did. Uh, I think that Minnesota will get back on track. I like the Lions; they're kind of fun. I like Dan mm. Campbell. Not a lot of people do. I think he's, I think hey, he's a fun coach. Man. Come on, yeah. man! This one's feel great, man. Back to work, man. Um, Bad I think it's gonna be an sh- absolute shootout. Uh, be surprised if Adam Thielen has like a seven catch, one hundred yard 
one score game. I wouldn't be surprised. Or uh, or Dalvin Cook goes for like a buck fifty. One of those two is going off this weekend. For sure. I, I could see that. Baltimore at New England. I think the Ravens, Lamar Jackson's continuing, gonna continue his climb and kind of remind people who he is this year. Uh, and Baltimore is going to win this one. New England looks completely inept offensively. Yeah, it, yeah. Baltimore is going to, yeah. If no, someone, John Harbaugh is going to have them motivated. It's, it, it could get ugly quick. In New for England. sure, for sure. Cincinnati at New York. The Jets coming off their first uh, win of the season and one of the weirdest comebacks I've ever seen. Cincinnati loses in overtime, a heartbreaker. They're zero and two, which I don't think anyone could have predicted uh, this early in the season. I think Cincinnati, this is just Joe Burrow being Joe Burrow, gets them off the schneid, uh, gets them on track. And the Jets, sure, it was a fun last week uh, celebration, but Cincinnati is going to remind people why they're AFC contenders for a reason. Yeah. Uh, Joey Cool has spent all week not saying shit. This team is definitely pissed off at the way these last two games have gone. Yeah. And they're going to go in there. And the fact that people even think the Jets could play on the same field as them. They're going to take that as a as a as a shot, a personal shot, and I think Burrow is going to throw for almost. He might throw for over. Actually, I'm going to say Joe Burrow is going to throw for 400 yard plus yards. Take it. Oh wait, uh, shit! I retract that because it's in New York, and I think it's supposed to rain on Sunday. Oh, good call. But Cincinnati, Cincinnati's still going to win. Okay, good call there. New Orleans at Carolina. This might be one of the weirdest games. I I want to take Carolina, just I, but I'm very not confident with that pick. I'm sticking with my preseason dark horse. They they shouldn't. They're they're a rough zero and two. They could be two and zero. I think they get it off to Schneid this weekend. I have no faith in New Orleans and what they really bring. Uh, Sean Payton's already talking about a comeback. Um, Jameis basically has like no ribs. And as it turns out, you kind of need ribs to breathe and move as a human being. Uh, I think Baker comes out and has a big game. And I think the Carolina finally gets their first win. First. Uh, yeah. And, but trust me, I am not very sold on that Carolina pick. Uh, Jacksonville at Los Angeles to take on the Chargers. Justin Herbert coming off that rib injury on Thursday night against the Chiefs. Jacksonville in sole possession of the AFC South. So far, we we talked, Timmy, you called it. Jacksonville could be a trap team that could give teams fits, not necessarily make the playoffs, but it looks like that so far early in the stages. I think that Herbert, with a week to recover, I'm sure he's been taking it light in practice, but he's still on top of his shit. I think the Chargers are going to come back, avenge that loss to Kansas City, and just keep on trucking, keep on moving. But I do think Jacksonville will make it competitive. You know me, I am a big Chargers fan, always have been since the days of LT and even before that in the 90s, always been a big Chargers fan for Junior Seau. First real big upset of the season here. I think the Jaguars go in there, Herbert still a little sore maybe, Keenan Allen still out, there's there's some miscommunication, there's, there's a little bit, the 10 days off might have backfired on them. Jacksonville goes in kind of under the radar, Sneaks one out like in a in a ugly maybe like twenty one or twenty four to like fifteen game or something weird something weird's gonna happen you're, you're gonna have a defensive touchdown a safety something weird is happening here Jacksonville's gonna get the first real upset of the season and it's gonna set the Chargers back but it's gonna be their last setback and I think after they lose this Sunday watch out for a big win streak. I like I like that call. Uh, Los Angeles at Arizona, Arizona, which looks just like the Kyler Murray show, kind of like the Michael Vick days uh, in Atlanta when he first got there. The Rams, not necessarily off to the hottest start either. They could possibly, possibly, could it happen? Could they fall below 500 for the first time in here? Uh, we shall see. Uh, but... They take on the Arizona Cardinals. NFC West showdown. I think Los Angeles is hitting its stride, at least offensively, and I think the defense is going to recover. Uh, not recover, but I should say look like the defense of last season against the Cardinals who don't have DeAndre Hopkins. They Kyler Murray looked like a, just looked like a chicken with its head cut off, uh, just running around trying to find someone who would be open. A.J. Green, I'm 
not the guy from, from 2015. And I just think that Los Angeles is going to remind people the stack roster that they have. And Arizona is once again going to be in the is Cliff Kingsbury going to be fired after this season conversation for the next week or so. Yeah, uh, I think that everyone's going to people might be tricked into thinking Arizona, hey, they got maybe they are decent, blah, blah, blah. Now they're, they're going to just go back to the old ways of being exposed. James Connors already banged up. Uh, like you said, no Hopkins until week seven or eight or something. AJ Green catches one every of every five balls, which is sad of a player of his caliber. Caliber, like you said, I think the Rams defense rebounds. I think that they're they get a running game going uh, strictly because McVay is going to want to try and protect Stafford's arm, and I think they they win easily. And uh, like you said, I think Kingsbury first career fired odds uh, start back up again. Also. For everyone that's like like ranting and raving about that Kyler Murray play, which was great, if you think that was awesome, I encourage you all, young people, to go to this little site called YouTube, type in a name known as a man that goes by the name of Seneca Wallace. He was a quarterback at Iowa State in the early 2000s. If you think what Kyler Murray did there was something, go look up Wallace's run against, I want to say, Texas Tech, maybe I forget who it was against. Maybe Missouri, actually. Uh, and it it will make Kyler Murray's run look like child play. Trust me. With and and Kyler Murray at least knew he could dump the ball off to one of like three good weapons. Seneca Wallace didn't have that shit back then. He was a one man wrecking crew at, at Iowa State and somehow got it done every year and willed them to seven to eight wins. So go look that up if you think Kyler Murray's run was fun. Seneca Wallace's run from two thousand, I believe. Is, is is way better. I did not have Seneca Wallace shout out on my podcast episode bingo card for tonight. Love it. The, it's called The Run. Of course, it's not going to tell me who it's against. Uh, it's from description. November 13th, 2001. Just type in Sen- YouTube. Just literally Google Seneca Wallace, The Run. Yeah. Uh, so, was right the first time. <laughs> t- Texas Tech or Missouri? Which one was it? No, it was Texas Tech. Yeah, that's who it was against. And you'll uh, look at that, by the way, when they'll see it, they'll say Iowa State was number 11. It, that, that, that meant nothing. Trust me. <laughs> it, it, it's remarkable what that man did for that team. Uh, back to the NFL. Atlanta at Seattle. I don't, uh, yeah, that's a rough 425 game. I feel bad for whoever has to call that game for Fox. Um I'm going to take Seattle, I guess. Atlanta looks inept offensively. That dark horse pick that I made in the beginning of the season, not looking good so far. And Seattle, I think they could just tweak a few things. And Pete Carroll always has his teams ready to go. So I'm going to take Seattle, especially at home. Yeah, like out, like Gino hasn't been great, but like there was a part of that game last week where Seattle was like in it with San Fran. Like their defense was making plays again. Like it wasn't like San Fran didn't blow them out of the water. Um, it's this is a, oh my god, this is a putrid matchup. Uh, <laughs> it is bad. It is a very bad game. Yeah. Also, the, I'm a fraud because he's not. But the hype train that I had been expressing and how it needed to slow down on Kyle Pitts, I think, is kind of coming to the realization. Granted, he doesn't have a QB, but. Now you understand, people, that he isn't the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yes, he is a very talented player, but one of those he's not one of those players that makes a QB better. He needs a QB to help him be better, I think. Uh, so, you know, hopefully he can get that figured out. But, yeah, I guess Seattle because they're at home in the 12th man. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty uh, – uh, Green Bay at Tampa. This just feels like the 150 billionth time that I, we've heard Brady versus Rodgers on – uh, football night in America or whatever it is uh, at Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay does not look good at all. They're signing Cole Beasley because they don't really have any weapons. Chris Godwin and Julio Jones are both questionable. Uh, it's, Evans is suspended because once again, uh, he uh, yeah. made Marshawn Lattimore's bait as always. Yeah, exactly. Mar- Mike Evans suspended again, or Mike Evans suspended for taking Marshawn Lattimore's bait, uh, getting into an altercation. Green Bay is rolling. I think that they'll figure out a way to keep it moving. 
they, it feels like they're figured out a way to use Aaron judge better or not Aaron judge, Aaron judge, Jesus, Aaron Jones. Uh, and I think that Alan Lazard being back into the fold. No, he's an, questionable again, again, God damn it. This dude can't stay off in the injury report. All right. never speaking mind. Of Iowa, speaking of Iowa state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Speaking of the, the cyclones, uh, but still, it's Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Jones, and A.J. Dillon. I'm sure we'll get plenty of carries and touches. So I I just don't think that Tampa Bay's defense is going to uh, be able to hold up this week. Uh, it's different when you're going up against Rodgers compared to Jameis Winston. So I'm going to take the Packers. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's almost like we're like – went back in time when we're having the same conversation that we did last year about the Packers after week one and week two where – yeah, they did absolutely nothing, and then week two they came out and it was like, "Hey, maybe we should get our All Pro running back the ball and his what could be an All Pro backup, but he's just a, he's our he's his backup, and involve him a little bit more and take some of the pressure off of our our you know Hall of Fame quarterback. I was gonna and say all time top twenty five quarterback of all time, the top ten quarterback of all time. I'm being um, generous just so I don't get some aggregator that's like if, if people if people don't think he's top ten, they're then they don't know sports or they don't know the NFL. Um, top right. ten quarterback this is. Uh yeah. And it literally same thing this year as last year. Week one, nothing. Week two, Jones explodes. AJ Dillon has a nice game. Rogers, less of the pressure on him, performs better. Like you said, Tampa Bay doesn't look great. Their defense is good, but Brady looks like is in the middle of a divorce, which might actually be happening from what all the rumors are out there saying. He looks like that he hasn't been fed in weeks, which might Seriously. be true since Giselle He looks like Gollum house. from, like, Lord of the Rings. Like, it is like, not ugh. – You can't tell me Giselle was making all those all those meals. Like, you definitely have maids or, like, chefs. Like Oh, So yeah, maybe he's just sure. not eating out of depression or something like that. Um, I don't know. But uh, I think that's something that's going to actually stick with them the like long like not to be like weird but like like it's a cloud tell, that's going to be hanging you over. can tell something's fucking with his mind yeah and you know as any party who's been in a relationship that has gone sideways like a long-term relationship that has gone sideways and you know and how you know i i can tell you your brother anybody could tell you how it kind of fucks you up no matter what even if you're trying to put on a good face you can kind of tell it's affecting brady's everyday life and uh, I think Tampa Bay is going to have more uh, questions and answers here in the early part of the season um, until someone convinces Gis- Giselle to come back to Tom. Uh, I actually think this is Green Bay in a route. Yeah, I would not be I think they'll, I think they'll stomp them. I think they'll come in and Rodgers is sitting in the fourth quarter. That's how good it's going to be. I would not be surprised. San Francisco at Denver, Jimmy G, first uh, start, first start, I guess, from – First start of the season. God damn it. Why did my brain not put that together? <laughs> uh, Trey Lance, unfortunately, <sighs> goal injury. Poor guy. Poor guy. I, yeah, I really feel bad for him. He was getting he was getting his shot to at least develop and get a chance. And you never want to see a quarterback get, uh, get benched or, I guess, lose a starting job because of an injury. You'd much rather prefer it be like, you know, because of right. ability or skill, because then at least they have a chance to get back into the starting position. Anyway, Denver seems like kind of like a weird dumpster fire that is almost ex- extinguished with like piss. Like Nathaniel Hackett seems like he's a deer in headlights trying to navigate this relationship with Russ and the offense looks atrocious but the defense looks great. I mean, they granted it was the Houston Texans, but they only gave up nine points last weekend and really held the Texans from driving when the Texans had a couple of opportunities to tie the game late last weekend. So with that all being said, I think San Francisco is rolling right now, and I think the team just prefers Jimmy G at this stage and is more confident winning now with Jimmy G rather than Trey Lance simply due to the fact to the of the raw – of Trey Lance just as a quarterback I think he just needs more time and I think right now they know that if it's aliens come down and they need one quarterback to win a game for whatever reason aliens decide that a football game is the great way to decide the fate of humanity uh, I think the 49ers would rather roll with Jimmy G and I'm going to take the 49ers 
uh, to win this one. And I think this is where you really see the holes of Denver really exposed here. So I agree with everything you just said. I think there's some weird thing going on with their, with their, with Denver's offense. Um, Nathaniel Hackett looks a little bit out of his depth, but at the same time, I'll say like, like I was like kind of like shaking my head listening to the Simmons podcast when him and Cousin Sal were like, oh, what, what are these coaches doing? And it's like, well, there's a reason you two idiots have never been hired to be an NFL head coach. So like as much as there's any that. of us criticize these guys, it's like, yeah, well, you could sit here and say, oh, I would know what to do. And then you'd get in there and you'd be like, fuck, what if I do the wrong, call the wrong play? There's 70 million people ready to chop my head off because I should have ran, run the ball instead of three. You know what I mean? So like, Yes, we can sit there and complain to our TVs, but like in real life, none of us know the pressure these people are under. Yeah. I, like exactly. I said, I agree with everything. It, it definitely sucks about the Lance thing. Let's hope for a full recovery and that he can have a promising career. The 49ers definitely look smart now by keeping Jimmy G, huh? Uh, Seriously. I think it definitely gives them a better chance this year to win because it allows them to throw the ball more, which will help them utilize a, uh, Brandon Ayuk and – Devo mm -hmm. out and uh, Kittle outside of their running game. Um, yeah. Elevate at Marlon Mack. Watch out for him to have a surprise game. That said, Russ against an old NFC West opponent, one that he loves sure. to go against, the Seahawks 49ers rivalry oh, in two different like lifetimes of Russ being the quarterback existed. You know, his in early his early years when it was, you know, it was the, the hardball. Yeah, the Legion of Boom versus Harbaugh. And then they kind of sucked for a little bit while Russ always stayed good. And now they've been back a little bit. And it, it Russ is towards the end of Russ's career. Russ, I think, loves getting up against the 49ers. He, he probably has a 500, a better than 500 record against them. I think it might not right the ship. But I think the Broncos, for at least one game, look like they have a positive offense. They have a good offense. They, they come out. They hang about 24 on the 49ers and win like a close one, like 24-17, 24-21. Russell Wilson is 16-4 and four versus the 49ers in his career. So good call on that stat. Uh, Monday Night Football, the quarterback matchup that NFL Films we, has We never knew built. we needed it. <laughs> yeah, the NFL Films has been – was created – to chronicle events like this and Monday night football, Howard Cassell is turning over his, in his grave that he cannot call this game between Cooper rush and Daniel Jones as the Dallas Cowboys somehow pulled out a win out of their ass against the Cincinnati Bengals and the New York giants somehow pull a little win out of their asses, two wins out of their asses. And they're two and zero for the first time since 2016 um, at New York, Dallas really got by the skin of their teeth. And maybe this is the turn for the Giants and they carry this momentum into a home game nationally televised and Saquon once again uh, has a similar performance to what he had in week one and kind of reminds people who he is as a running back. And I would not, it'll be interesting to see Saquon Barkley go up against Micah Parsons if they ever meet in the hole that I would, that matchup, I will love if we get it at some point. Uh, so I'm going to take the Giants, surprisingly. Uh, I'm not really – I don't it's, know which – It's at the – what's it called, right? I want, it's at the Meadowlands, right? Meadowlands, MetLife, whatever. Yeah, it's, yeah, even in New Jersey, but they're called the New York Giants. No, 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 nothing that I don't hate. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> that's a whole podcast we could do. And so I'm going to take the Giants. I think they're just the, – the momentum is rolling with them right now, and I think Dallas is just – Barely getting by. And also, did you see that Jerry Jones said he would welcome a QB controversy? <laughs> my hand. I mean, my hand it's not is hard not... because I think Dak's the most, one of the most overrated QBs in the last two decades. My hand does not cramp right in checks. If Cooper can prove that he can be the guy, if Cooper Manning can lead us to victory, I welcome it. <laughs> um, so. I was I was looking up like this Cooper Rush guy because eh, like anything it's like where the hell did this dude come from like obviously like what, like how long has he been in the league blah 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 because he looked competent on Sunday he looked he looked good right you could win games with him 
Not all of them. Some. Obviously, Romo, we talked about this. Romo giving him the full-on, you know, BJ, which uh, yeah. I kind of like. I used to, I, you know, when Romo first started, I was a big fan of him. But he's been more and more a little bit, like, annoying. And after Sunday, it was like, dude, like, keep it in your pants, man. Like, <laughs> after they kicked the game-winning field goal. And he's just yeah. like, and what about this? The story you never thought you needed. Cooper Rush comes in and steals a game from everyone's darling from last year, Joe Burrow, and supplants him as the guy. And it's like, no. He no. also – what? who caught the ball that he compared to Julian Edelman making the catch against uh, the Falcons yeah. in 52? I, I I agree. It felt like he was like Paul Heyman putting over Brock Lesnar in, like, WWE. It was like, like – Settle down. No, it was like when he was Paulie Dangerous with the ECW, like and it yeah. just making like just like just being so absurd, which was great. Like as that character, like great the, television, he, how, but not good ECW for a football what broadcaster. Was. Yeah, the original ECW when it was in Philadelphia, out of you know down on down in South Philly. Yeah. Um, that said, yeah, like it's like I looked him up and it's like, did you know he went to Central Michigan? Did you know his in his maybe his junior year in the Bahamas Bowl? It was Central Michigan versus Western Kentucky. Great directional school matchup there. At the end of three quarters, it was 49 to 14, Western Kentucky. Cooper Rush went to Central Michigan. He's like their all time leader in everything. Like he's like, like he's, he's got all, had most of the stats outside of like most yards ever. Yeah. Uh, who this other guy, Dan Lefevre, has it, who was like the probably the greatest. Central Michigan player ever like to play like besides Cooper Rush at this point, forty nine to fourteen after three quarters. Western Michigan lost forty nine to forty eight. That's Damn. how crazy of a comeback he had. Cooper Rush's final stat line was twenty eight for forty five for four hundred and ninety three yards, seven touchdown passes, and one interception. My man's was playing Madden with the easy sliders, and on. the only reason they lost. The coach decided after they scored a Hail Mary double, triple lateral time after as time expired. Crazy. It's a crazy lateral. Even crazier than the one against how they beat Oklahoma State a couple years later. Okay. Yeah. They decided, screw it. We're just going to go for two. And that's the only reason they lost. They went for two instead of trying to send the game to overtime. Jesus. So I look at it and I'm like, oh, so this guy wasn't just some random dude. Like, obviously, it's the Mac, but. He he put up stats, man. He he could throw. He looked competent. He looks comfortable. He obviously has some weapons to throw to. I'm not saying he's going to be a Hall of Fame quarterback, and I'm not even saying that he's going to look good again for the next five weeks or however long Dak's out this time. But you know, the Bengals are a good team. They have a solid defense. He looked decent against them. The Giants, who knows? I just wouldn't be surprised if – if this go- keeps going for another couple of weeks where he's not like great, but he looks solid enough that like he's yeah. helping them win a couple games here and there. Yeah. Um, and you know, like it's not out of, it's not really out of the realm for Jerry to be like, I welcome it because it's like, I'm sorry, but like Dak isn't that good. Has he ever even won a playoff game? I don't think he's he won has. one. He's won one. He's he won ha- one. Oh, right. Right. Cause then they lost to the Rams in the, in the second round. Yeah, they, and then they lost to the Rams in the second round. Did they lose to the Rams? I thought they it was lost the, to – It was 2019 – it was the 2018 season that the, when the whole Rams P.I. thing to get to the Super Bowl against the Saints. But I thought that – but wasn't there also – what about the comeback that to the Packers? Was that a regular season game? Yeah, that wasn't okay. – a... Never that mind. wasn't yeah that wasn't a no that was that wasn't a playoff game they beat okay that's they probably why. beat okay, the, i think mind. they beat like the falcons or something like they beat yeah, a nobody that's what it was yeah yeah, yeah. it was the falcons and yeah, yeah it was a 2018 and then they went in the second round and they played the rams the year they they were like really good so, but <laughs> yeah all right so well, it was that random game that the one guy ran for all those yards the backup running back yeah skirt skirt let's circle back to this game cowboys at giants who are you picking uh I hope they all get sick and can't play the rest of the year so the Eagles have an easier time to win the division. No. Um, that would be nice. Home game, Giants. I think the, the lore falls off a little bit from Cooper Rush. I'll take the Giants. Fair. Uh, okay, that wraps up NFL. Last thing, we're going to hit this quickly. 
because my roommate is like low key trying to get in so he can like sleep. I feel bad. Um, Tell him it's my fault. Yeah, Blame I me. will. I'm uh, long winded. We're looking up Cooper Rush, Central Michigan, Western Kentucky stat lines. That's why. Crazy so, game. It, it, it sounds like a crazy game. So, uh, Ime Udoka, widely perceived as probably one of the best coaching hires the last year, especially by in a city and an organization like the Boston Celtics, um, which the city itself, racial history, not the best track record to say the least. I'm not going to go not down that route. Ra- yeah. Not, not going to go down that rabbit hole. Not the best track record, but the Celtics themselves, very, very good rate uh, racial track record compared to uh, the rest of the league. I think you would say um, that being said, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Red hour back hundred percent. Yeah. One of the pioneers. Exactly. So Ime Udoka comes in, the Celtics get off to a dog turd of a start. And then by mid-January, they go on a historic turnaround. They get all the way to the NBA Finals, and Steph Curry does Steph Curry things, and they lose the NBA Finals. A lot of hope, a lot of promise in Boston that Jason Tatum and Jason Jalen Brown and Ime Udoka can really come together and create something special in Boston. And then at 1.35 in the morning on a Thursday, Adrian Wojnarowski decided, you know what? I'm going to just drop a bombshell on Twitter. <laughs> because apparently, Ime Udoka is going to get suspended for the entire season in the organization for, I cannot emphasize this enough, a consensual sexual relationship with a female staff uh, member within the organization. So far, what I've seen is that this was uh, the team – cited vi- team violations or organizational violations uh, as a reason for the suspension. And this is a massive loss because all of a sudden the Celtics, that seemed like a team with a championship window, at least for the next season, that window may be closed already before ball even goes up to, t- to get tipped. Uh, bad analogy for this situation. Um, and so this really changes the landscape of the East. It opens the door for a few teams opens the door for the Sixers to rise up potentially in the East rankings come playoff time. So now how do the Celtics adjust? Is, is, is the Celtics season dead already, Timmy? Um, it's weird, right? Like, I don't know what other situation we could compare Cause it to. Cause yeah. Like it's like weird. Like, cause like you said, the key word is consensual. So and, and, and that's the thing that's, that's very strange about this is, is that people are like, what, like two adults can't fuck? Like, not to be crass about it, but that's like what basically like the internet's been saying. Yeah. It's not my terminology. That's like <laughs> Twitter and Instagram. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's it's basically like what? Two two adults can't, you know, enjoy each I, that's other's how, company. That's how, and, uh, not, not that specifically. I, I don't want to think about that specific situation, but my sister met her future husband through work. Like that, that just happens sometimes right. where you date coworkers. Right. No. And it's, and, but then like, you know, so, and I, and I, and I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, um, oh, yeah. But then I felt back and I'm like, of, of, since I graduated college and, and of the four places I have worked since I, I graduated college over a decade ago, at every single place I've been at, there has been some sort of like, not like met with me, like, but, but directly involved. Like I, I had never been involved in any of it. Let me put, let me put it that way. But uh, every place I've worked at the government, I mean, um, the ear pods went dead. Or AirPods. Yeah, sorry. Why did I call them ear pods? Oh, that's yeah, old. Stupid. Um, no, stupid that they went dead. Sorry. Um, like any the CCP, like like sorry, like any of these places, uh, whatever. If you want to bleep out the places I've worked, it doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me. Even a small company, the small company yeah. that worked in between Boeing and the government, there was an issue in one of our other offices. Thirty employees, and there was an issue, which is crazy to think. Like not even an issue. It was just more like, all right, you guys either got to break it off or not. Um, and so like when I'm like, yeah, I agree. Like they're adults if it's consensual, whatever, like the whole nine yards. But then I'm like, well, you kind of can't. And it's like, you know, like, and it's just like, and it's, and you know, and that that's the, that's the, 
the the law at a lot of these places and like when i worked for the government i'm like at least four different people i knew that had got moved into different buildings because they got caught having relations either and whether a lot of the time three of the four times that the people were married and were having an inappropriate affair which is a whole other side of the story Uh, yeah clearly so it wouldn't surprise me if somehow this comes out and you find out that the reason that him and Nia Long aren't together anymore is because of this or that this staffer was married and her marriage is now on the rocks or something mm. regardless. Um, you know, at Boeing, the, when I was there, like the CEO or something got caught having a relationship with the secretary was told to knock it off two different times. They got caught again, like seven months later and he got like a one or $2 million pen like buyout. Like, it's just like, it's just, it's yeah. a thing. And 99% of workplaces, people will meet, they can fall in love. And, you know, like you said, with, with your sister and your brother-in-law, um, unfortunately I've been on the wrong end of that where my ex met the guy she is now married to when we were still together. Like it, it happens. That's what people yeah. do, right? Most workplaces people, discourage people, it. It's, they don't, there's no law. They discourage it. And that's the thing. Yeah. Whether it condones a full year suspension that's what i don't yeah. agree with so that's why i think i the, what i am thinking and what i'm sure most people are thinking is there is something else going on here okay like like so like when this news broke my buddy sent me the thing last night he found it like on the deep dark recesses, recesses of twitter at like 11 30 at night yeah and so he sent it to me like before like so when you sent it to me this morning I'd already heard something about it, but I didn't want to text you when I when I got it last night uh, because it was past the hour that I, I'll normally text people. Um, and I joked to my buddy and I'm like, what did they do? Co- catch them like going to Cokefield orgies? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and then it comes out. <laughs> Some Wolf like, of Wall of Street type I'm like, shit. I'm like, oh, like, well, I guess uh, it was everything but the Coke, maybe. It, like, you know, like, <laughs> obviously not. So. It's weird, man, because it's like they're two adults. They're allowed to do what they want. You hope that no one else got hurt in this situation because yeah. that is a shitty thing to have happen. Speaking from personal experience and also watching other people and knowing other people that have to speak from that personal experience. It's not fun. Mm-hmm. It, it, it ruins your life. It, it messes you up in ways you can never believe. You question everything that is good with, with God. Like you, It sucks. So you hope that what these two were doing was on the up and up obviously in the consensual way it was but it was on the up and up in that they they weren't cheating on anybody else nothing was like that and the celtics are just being taken precautionary measures and and you know they can't fire the the staffer because it's like well what do you like but you're not going to fire a head coach yeah so i understand the suspension but the full year is very weird it also is very brave on the celtics part in the sense that they are like, listen, I, we understand that there is a title window right now and we might be potentially screwing this up completely because the other question that comes in now, it's like, all right, he serves his year suspension. What happens if they succeed with this 34 year old interim coach? Most likely won't be as good, but still, what if they succeed? But okay. even if not, it's like, it's going to be weird to just bring him back. Yeah, and then just plug them in and be like, "Oh yeah, coach right. is back. Like, Everything's okay." What are the like, you know? So what do the players feel of this? Like, how do they look at it? Like, you know, were they pissed that the, that that it's like, damn, coach, like you couldn't have picked someone else or you couldn't have kept it in your pants? Like, you know, it's like, what are they thinking? Like, dude, we yeah, had a chance exactly. at the title. We were two games away last year, and now you're gone for a whole year, and we got to listen to a guy that was like our fifth assistant last year. Well, that and it's also like I'm wondering if part of it also another component of this is the timing, especially coming off the Robert Sarver news that. Oh, absolutely. The NBA. It's it's today's world, too. Like if this was 2005. It's sad to say, but I don't think he would have got suspended. Oh, no, not at all. I don't I don't I don't think even five years ago he would have gotten suspended for it. Um but I think coming off the Robert Sarver news, NBA teams are definitely feeling some type of pressure, at least public from the public, to take a stand against um, certain 
misconduct in the workplace that can be interpreted in different ways. And I think that, yes, this was consensual, but I think the NBA is trying, definitely trying to push like workplace stability and good in workplace environments. And it's tough to op. I'm sure it's tough to operate in a place and an environment efficiently when you're in love or you're banging your coworker. Like it's just a tough, no, like yeah. it's, 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 it's a not- tough, it's a tough position to be in. And I think the Celtics, and they were in between a rock and a hard place and they don't even have to be better than the record wise, at least compared to last year, they just have to show enough glimmers of hope to convince Celtics brass to be like, Oh yeah. What if we did just, just quietly let Ime walk, find a new job and then hire this new assistant coach and make the interim, the permanent head coach moving forward to give us more continuity. Like that definitely could happen in my opinion. No. Yeah. And it's, and like I said, like I've seen it, like I saw how it was like, like with people like being in relationships that they shouldn't have been in at work. And, and that's what the Celtics definitely like we're stuck in between a rock and a hard place. And that's why you got to give them kudos to like, they did the hard thing. Mm-hmm. They put, they, they did, they did, they put morality over like, like basically being worshiped for titles. Which very few team, few sports organizations few do. And I, you know what? I never even thought about it, but you're a hundred percent right, Matt. saying the Sarver thing definitely, has something that probably has something to do with it. But as you also stated in the beginning of this, the Celtics have always been as much as we want to not like them because they're one of our rivals. They have always been at the forefront of like leading for change when it comes to integrating rosters and having a, having an African-American coach mm-hmm. and having African-American GMs and like, you know what I mean? Like, and stuff yeah. like that, they've always been at the forefront. And I think that that, even though um, he's no longer with us, I think that that organization still carries on the way that they would want that Red Auerbach would want you to carry on. And oh, I think, for, oh, for sure. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. hundred. And I think the owners know that. And I think it's, and it's, they, they understand it's up to them to be like, because like, let's say they like, Oh, whatever it happens. And then it's just like, yeah, but like, obviously they like, and even if they don't let go of the female staffer, you're still going to have like title nine and stuff probably coming after you and be like, what? So there's just no repercussions for him. But like, what, what are the situation was flipped? But, and it's just like, you know what I mean? And it's like, but that'll be interesting if the Celtics are like, this is if ty- if like, you know, someone tries to come after him for like title nine stuff. It's like, no, this was consensual. Like this was consensual. This was just right. a, a cell, like how college programs do like self-disciplinary action i'm not saying that like this is right or wrong but like this was kind of like a private in-house issue that we needed to work with on our hr team with and interview people and see what the relationship was like and we're going to handle this ourselves so like stay the fuck out of it basically so no exactly and like you said it's just like that, like that they got ahead of it because like you said it, it can't be easy it's not easy being in a relationship in general let alone being the one at work when you're there and you're like want to like be like flirty or something with the other person but you can't because you have to keep a professional but then it's just like you have to also like keep your things in check your feelings in check and it's just like and like like i said like i've been on the one side where I, it's happened like it, the other side the one the bad side where it's, it's happened to me where i've been the victim but I've also been in the situation of my first job where I was single for a little bit and a coworker that I, her and I had like developed feelings for each other when I was in a relationship, but then broke up and we were both single and we kind of like started hanging out a little bit. And we both agreed after like, like a month, like we put the brakes on it and we're like, this isn't good. Cause what happens if it goes sideways and who knows how long are both of us are going to be working for the government. Yeah, And like we put it in, it sucks because who knows what it could have been, but I don't have to worry about that now because like I, I have the life I have and I'm, I'm happy, but I've been, I've been in both situations and I can tell you how hard it was every day going in there and trying to do my job, but at the same time, trying to like get as men, get as much time as I can to spend with her. Cause it was like free hangout time, but then also trying to keep it in check. So I look professional and also, so my bosses didn't find out that like what was going on. And eventually, like, my one boss did know. He did find, like, he knew. He came to me and was like, listen, just be smart about it. Just don't do something stupid that's going to make me fire you or fire her or both of you Mm. guys. Like, you know, like, I'm just telling you now, just be smart about it. And that was one of the reasons, like, we called it off 
and you know and and you know for the better but it's like so it's like you're, you're right in so, that sense it's, just, it's i don't see so and, and what i guess my real way of saying this is i do not see any way the celtics will bring him back even if it doesn't go great with this interim coach i just don't there's no way back now he's gone and yeah. i think it's going to take a while for him to work his way back up and it sucks because he had a bright future he still has a future but unfortunately that reputation is completely is, altered is now right and it's, someone's gonna have to take a risk and someone will and they should because this isn't like he raped someone which would be totally different this isn't like he got caught like you know like he's not like he's like was hiding it wasn't an addiction a, 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 and all, it like, wasn't all any mis- yeah it wasn't any misconduct or anything like, like that. it wasn't anything terrible like he didn't get caught he didn't get arrested for a dui where he ran somebody over like it was it was just like it was an adult thing that happened and the celtics just felt that it's not something that they, they don't condone it's in their guidelines it's in most work guidelines and you know, unfortunately, it, it it's it might cost him his career for the foreseeable future. I just I would be very surprised if at this time next year we're talking about the return of Ime Duco to the Celtics bench. I'd be very surprised. And that does it for all of us here at the Black and Blue Pod. My roommate's got to get in so he can go to sleep. Uh, great show. If you like this, like, comment subscribe on the youtube channels uh and on the audios uh if you enjoy listening to us like old timey radio shows that my dad listens to uh (laughs) like comment subscribe uh follow us on all audio stuff where you can get your podcast apple spotify google whatever uh and we will catch you all in the next episode